welcome Ian Upperman. And uh, for those who weren't with us yesterday, Ian Upperman is a renowned IT expert with long experience in both the public and private sectors. And he's currently serving as chief data scientist for the New South Wales government in Australia. And he's also IEC board member. And Ian, um, Please now try to link up that slightly braided together uh, <laughs> assessment that we just got from Ray and Roland to essentially the conference aim of facilitating future cooperation. What do the insights that we've just heard about, but also that you've garnered over the course of these two days, what do they add up to in the way of guidelines for a kind of a roadmap uh, of next steps? Thank you. I'm very glad that Ray and Roland did that summary. I've been watching Ray take copious notes during the course of today and yesterday, and I would not have remembered all the things that they have remembered for us. I think partly what we've realised is that AI is a topic that has finally come of age. It has been around since the middle 50s, so it's about 70 years old as a concept, and it's everywhere. The presentation of the panel that I sat on yesterday showed just how broadly AI has been deployed and is being deployed. And there are some very, very unexciting applications of AI. There are some interesting applications of AI. There are some somewhat frightening applications of AI. And we're living with all of it at the moment. Yesterday, I mentioned the reason that I have the title of Chief Data Scientist for New South Wales Government is that it, it's taken seriously that we're, we're using AI. We're using data, we're using machine learning, we're using real AI. And when I started in the role, it was almost forbidden to use AI for operational purposes. And now it's increasingly being applied in, in many, many parts of government. That's just one jurisdiction, one example. So it's inevitable. And I guess over the course of 70 years, we've had a few movies to thank for some of our thinking about the, the potential of AI, the, the, both the utopian and the dystopian perspectives of AI. So when we're thinking about AI with trust, we come with a whole lot of of cultural acknowledgement of the potential. We come with a whole lot of amazement and a little bit of fear about what we're seeing in use of AI. And we're coming increasingly to understand that just because we can deploy it, we don't necessarily have a, a really good sense of the consequences of that deployment of AI. And in particular, people are terrible at identifying unintended consequences. It's, it's almost, it is counterintuitive to think about what the unintended consequences are of deployment of AI. So what we've seen is a call for a couple of things. We've seen a call for collaboration because AI that makes a difference in the real world goes well beyond the scope of at least the current IEC. If we're talking about implants into people's eyes, or in fact, now we are literally talking about brain implants, uh, brain computer interfaces, one of the brand new areas that's being kicked off within the JTC1 collaboration with ISO. It's a very small step to say brain computer interface, software behind that brain computer interface, smart software behind that brain computer interface. We've suddenly got AI directly embedded in people's brains. Cyborgs. Absolutely. So it's not, it's not an out there thing. It's a we are currently embarking on it. So what it says is that our traditional scope of activity will not be sufficient to think of or to envisage, to contemplate, to, to help regulate all of the potential, all of the potential areas that AI can impact. But the first thing that I, I really think we need to, to play back is it has to be a, a collaboration activity. This is a team sport. The second thing is that Trust is a multi-dimensional aspect. It's a multi-dimensional characteristic, some of which relates to engineering concepts. But ultimately, as society, if we want to trust AI, then we need to trust something that we're becoming dependent on. Now, if, I, if you just indulge me just for a moment here. Today's population, the world's population is approximately 7.6 billion people. We know that by 2030, it's estimated to be about 8.5, 8.6 billion people. It used to be more fun a couple of years ago to say that's an extra billion people in the space of a decade, but it's an extra 800 million people between now and by the time we expect the UN Sustainable Development Goals to be realised. No more land, no more water, no more natural resources. We have a challenge of sustainable intensification. Where do we put, how do we feed, how do we educate, how do we improve the quality of lives of an extra 
800 million people, knowing that the climate is changing, knowing that we have an aging population, knowing that the ratio of people working compared to those retired is dramatically changing, at least in OECD countries. We have a challenge of sustainable intensification. We also know that we're increasingly digital, we're increasingly connected, and we're increasingly reliant on data and digital to improve the quality of our lives, to make us more efficient, to make us more productive. And we're increasingly reliant on AI to make sense of that data and digital. So the use of AI is not only inevitable now, it's going to accelerate over the course of this decade. Fast forward out to 2050, we know that we've got approximately 9.6 billion people on the planet. So compared to today, that's almost an extra 2 billion people with the same restrictions, no more land, no more water, no more natural resources. It is inevitable that we will use AI to drive productivity, to improve the quality of life and to deal with those climate change and aging population and changing expectations over time. So where we sit at the moment is that we are staring into something which looks like exponential change. And every year that we come together to have this conversation, we realize that we've moved further up that exponential curve and it still looks exponential, which is the nature of exponential changes. So we've talked about collaboration, we've talked about the need to discuss, and that's absolutely essential, but it is far from sufficient. We've talked about the need to, th to think through how we differentiate AI from other sorts of emerging technologies, from quantum and from other such things. And I gave the example of, of electricity. If we were having this conversation 100 years ago, we'd be, we'd be talking about electricity for good or electricity for health or electricity for various other things. So we need a way to think through the challenges, the opportunities and the risks of AI for today's applications. And we, we're doing good work in that space. We need to think through the challenges and opportunities of emergent technology. Some of the things that uh, Anush was talking about with, with implants and with the, the use of AI to augment us, the use of AI to enhance our, our senses, the use of AI in devices and material, and the use of AI in so many different aspects of the physical or, or, or the, the biological or digital world we operate in. And we're not ready for that. And we finally need to create a safe space where we can start to talk about the, the really out there ideas. What would happen? Why, what would happen if we allowed brain computer interfaces and we allowed direct stimulation or uploading of memory? What would happen if, what would be the consequences if that every single child received a unique tailored education and could have all sorts of augmentations to improve their, their educational outcomes? So, what we're starting to face is, I think, really the scale of both opportunity and threat, the, the misfit of some of the ways we think about AI when we start to project a little bit forward, and our need as human beings to ensure that we keep people at the centre, we ensure we humanise the technology, and that we feel comfortable in the world of principles that we do have a way to start to map those principles to what's happening with the bits and what's happening with the algorithms. I'm just looking at my phone because I actually forgot that I was to ask a poll. Um, so I'm going to quickly put our poll question out there and then we can pick up uh, on uh, the, the points that you've made and also take them forward. But uh, for those who haven't voted yet, I think some of you may have voted and it looks like the poll question may be a little bit different than the one that I have in my script, but it's going in the same direction. So um, let me just read this out. Ensuring that AI is trustworthy and that its benefits are shared by all depends on efficient interaction between legislators, standardizers, and conformity assessors. And you can agree, disagree, or express that you're not sure. And again, this is uh, for our online audience. You should be seeing a link where you can vote on that. And for those in the room, use the barcode, please, to access it and then we will get an answer on that shortly. And I won't give away what I already see as a partial answer here um, on the website. So excuse me for that, uh, Ian, for interrupting. But going forward, um, given all that you've said, including the uh, inevitability of, uh, of this exponential development and the fact that we have to ask those hard 
hypothetical questions that may uh, in fact uh, be, be, be so out there that uh, it's hard to know what unknowns we need to be asking about. Um, what does all that mean for a framework now for ongoing discussion, collaboration, bringing in the different elements that we've talked about, things that are as applied and concrete as standards and as broad as trying to get input from civil society on some of the big political and social challenges that we may be facing. So one of the things about that inevitability is that we are effectively creating a dependency on AI. Now we have had dependencies in the past. There are technologies we are dependent on. Again, electricity is a great example of a technology family that we are dependent on. If you turn off the electricity, it, people really suffer. We are creating a dependency on data-driven solutions. We're creating a dependency on AI solutions. And if that dependency meets a threat, then we actually create a vulnerability. And creating vulnerability is something that I think is, is, is quietly at the, at the heart of a lot of the concerns that people have around, around the use of AI. And that vulnerability is not just because of AI. We have vulnerabilities because of dependent on, dependence on complex systems and the parallel issue of cybersecurity. But just the complex systems themselves create dependencies. The number of, of steps between this microphone and you hearing it is, is many. And over time, a very trivial example, but over time, between anything we do and an outcome in the real world or an output in the real world, there are many, many steps between one point and another. And the network effect of those many steps creates a really complex web of interactions. So we are creating dependencies on technology, one of which is AI. But again, we've lived with dependencies on technology in the past. I think the role of, of this group of the IEC is to help lead the conversation in a couple of important areas, which ultimately lead to genuine outcomes, acknowledging that those, those outcomes cannot be achieved alone. If we projected forward to 2030, if we talked about the outcomes we want to achieve, so the real world outcomes, it might look like IEC helps the world live with the, the, the vulnerability slash dependence on technologies, including AI. That could be an outcome for the IEC by 2030. Some sub outcomes might be, the IEC has created a framework with others, which people use to assess existing AI solutions. So things that are currently in the market, things which are adapting, things which are changing. Another outcome, a sub outcome might be, that the IEC and others have created a framework to evaluate emergent technologies, which consider a whole range of technical, electrical, biological, societal, political issues, environmental, climactic issues. Another outcome might be that the IEC has created a safe space for people to use to ask the question, oh, well, what if we did? Or what would happen if we did? Or why can't we do that? And those get to the sort of questions around, should we really allow people to have brain computer interfaces where we allow upload or download of, of, of memory experiences? Should we allow off-site storage of people's lived experience? Should we allow augmentation of people's lived experience? So really important questions, which we're quite ill-equipped to answer at the moment, or we're quite ill-equipped to even discuss, except that we get a bit of a, a, a sick feeling in the bottom of our stomachs to say there's something not quite right here. So an outcome for, for 2030 might really be if you like a platform which allows society to live with that dependency, which allows society to evaluate existing solutions, allows society to explore emergent solutions, allows society to ask those really powerful questions, but really importantly, allows a way to communicate, not with regulators, not with technologists, not with inventors, not with scientists, not with engineers, but mums and dads and people mm -hmm. in other parts of the world who have had nothing to do with the development of technology, and it really is something that just comes into their lives. So a final outcome might be that the IEC and others have found a way to actively engage with people to communicate the dimensions and aspects of that technology. So those are outcomes, and part of the output that supports those outcomes are things like assurance frameworks for today's technology, things like assurance frameworks for emergent technologies, things like structured ways of decomposing difficult questions which separate out ethical parts from general technology parts from specific aspects of technology and methods for thinking about unintended consequences. 
So all of those things could be outputs in support of those outcomes. And again, when we see a really exciting bit of technology, if it doesn't look like a cute robot, because then we kind of know how to deal with it. It's a cute robot, it's been made to look cute, so we don't fear it. But if we look at things that make us uncomfortable, the question for us is, how do we uncover the component which is uncomfortable? And how do we ensure that when we're looking at it, it's uncomfortable, we take out the AI bit and we see whether we're still uncomfortable. We take out the data bit and we see whether we're still uncomfortable. Then we can actually look at that issue from a broader societal perspective and say, well, why are we uncomfortable about it? And is it the thing we're doing? And is that a cultural thing? Is it a this society issue or is it a more fundamental ethical issue? I think creating those sorts of frameworks would be very, very helpful when in 2030, we're sitting here, we're back in exactly the same chairs, and we're talking about the emerging technology of dark energy and whether or not we should use dark energy and how we might regulate dark energy. And do we have trust in dark energy? Because we will have sorted out quantum by then, we will have sorted out AI by then, <laughs> we'll have sorted out data. And, and now it will be, that will be then the, the, the I think the 35th anniversary of the discovery of dark energy. So we'll be having the conversation of how do we trust dark energy? Thank you very, very much for that so far. I'll just tell you the poll result as I see it now. This may still be changing a little bit, but it looks like around 70% agree that, uh, that efficient uh, interplay is absolutely key to building AI with trust. Another 25% or so, maybe a little bit less, uh, are not sure and a very, very small share of the audience. It looks like it might be about 6%. I'm looking at this on an iPhone, I'm sorry to say, so it's all a bit approximate, but it looks like around 6% disagree. Um, when we talk about that collaborative process, uh, we have you know, on our list of uh, interfacers, we have legislators, we have standardizes, standardization bodies, and we have conformity assessment uh, assessors. But it sounded to me through much of our discussion that a couple of other actors are also very key here. On the one hand, some of the global organizations that, that we were just talking about with Roland and Ray uh, that are wrestling with the larger societal and political implications. And on the other hand, civil society uh, organization that represent voices that need to be heard and also that are the outreach uh, or the bridges to communities, which you also just mentioned. Would you agree with that, that there is some role for, for those two sets of actors in this, in this collaborative process? Uh, yes, and. So, so yes, I, I certainly agree that there, are, there, there is a role for those sets of actors. And I think there are others who need to be involved in the conversation as well. The problem, of course, is that if you bring everybody in, into the room at the beginning of the conversation, you, you really won't get anywhere, or at least not anywhere in a, in a hurry. I, I do believe in limited specialization, where there are groups who've got a domain of focus and interest, other groups who have a domain of focus and interest, and, and others as well, and eventually these groups start to come together. One of the, what, let me just draw on some personal experience of data sharing and use. So uh, my, my hair used to be a different car, color. My forehead used to be not as flat. When I started my role as, as chief data scientist, all I was trying to do was get people to share data within government. So within the same government, within the same state, to get education to share data with health and health to share data with, with somebody else. And there are so many issues around data sharing and use that for the last seven years, I've, I've dedicated much of my waking life to trying, and some of my sleeping life as well, to trying to understand why people don't share data. What are those issues that don't, people don't share data? And in all circumstances, when you try and create a framework, someone can throw one rock and knock a hole in your data sharing framework. And so you try again and you build another one, someone throws the next rock and so on and so forth. And being able to slowly but surely build, I'm gonna change analogies slightly, on, on really swampy ground to build something which is solid enough, solid enough to be useful and then move to the next bit and the next bit and the next bit and the next bit and eventually get back to the point where you can reinforce that first stable foundation in the swampy ground. I, I moved my glass out of that of you. <laughs> has actually been quite useful. So we took a, what is, turns out to be a nearly infinitely complex problem, narrowed it down to something which was tractable, simple but tractable, and then slowly re-expanded the problem as we got better and better at, at the kernel of what we need to do. And I think AI is, is a similar situation. If we'd had uh, all sorts of, you know, really diverse group of people here, 
it would have been an interesting conversation. We would have all learnt a little bit more about the perspective of other folks, but it doesn't necessarily move the conversation forward. So I, I, I'm a genuine believer in limited specialization. Do things, firm them up, and then test. Don't finish it, don't complete it. Test then with people who've got a genuine stake and a genuine right to be part of the conversation. And the, the mistakes we make are, are, are many. I mentioned the, the, the global response to genetically modified foods. There is an absolute community backlash in so many parts of the world about GM foods. Despite all the productivity advances, despite all of the demonstrated scientific evidence of, of lack of harm, people just don't accept it. And that's partly because we, we haven't brought people along and people don't trust, they, 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 don't, they just simply don't believe. I also mentioned the 5G and COVID. I mean, that, I, I, as, a, as a telecommunications engineer, I just cannot believe there's an association in people's minds, mm -hmm. but it's true. So, but if, if the, the anti-COVID folks and the 5G folks had started working together in the first standards activity, I'm sure we wouldn't have got very far. But at some point we need to stop just being technical and start thinking about those other domains. And ultimately, if, if a technology is to have fundamental, profound societal impact, society has a right to be part of that conversation and not to have technology happen to society. So it slows things down, but getting started and then acknowledging that it's the village we need to work with at, at some point, at an appropriate point, and starting that conversation, as soon as you've got the first bits of stability in your swampy ground, I think is the approach to take. But having said that, I've, I've only got my own lived experience of, of trying to get data sharing to work, which has been a seven year journey with the New South Wales government. Thank you very much. Does anybody out there have a question uh, for Ian? I'll just, we have a little bit of extra time. So let me just quickly, yeah, please, Mark. Actually, one is an observation and one is a question. Uh, the swampy ground thing, I think, and, and your experience with trying to get people to share data is because of the, or data, whatever it is, Thank you. whichever you prefer, uh, is um, because of the feudal notion about data being mine. So the idea that I own it, and if I own it, then I've got to get some traction out of sharing yeah. it. And until we break that, I mean, I've spent the last, well, you've spent a fair amount of time, I've spent the last five years at least trying to get people to believe that if data isn't property, then you can't own it. And if you don't own it, then you might be better off if you could share it in a reasonable and rational world. It's the old Durkheimian notion of the collective conscience and working within that. That's just an observation. But my, my, my question to you, I suppose, is if we believe that the way forward is through an integrated approach to dealing with the problems, then how do we deal with different languages? You know, that, that those of us who come together with a common spirit, understand the risks, want to have a shared fate, but we just, it's like Babel, you know, we just have so many different languages. How can we overcome that language problem so that we're working towards something uh, which is simple and accessible? Thank you, and I expected a, a, a thoughtful question from you, and I'm glad you, you offered one up. So I think consistent approaches, base level consistent approaches are, are the way that groups can work together. So that we have a, a code of conduct, for example, which talks about working together to try and resolve problems. And that's a useful, consistent approach when people come together to try and work on problems. There are cultural differences about how people approach problem solving approach group work there are certainly differences in terms of the the rate at which you can contribute to a live meeting if you're speaking english as a second or third or fourth language and so there are real challenges there are also real challenges of trying to contribute when it's three in the morning uh, if you're dialing in from from somewhere uh, which is not where the, the center of the meeting is so having consistent rules of engagement is an imperfect but i i hope still useful answer which allows people to get started and then ensuring that as, as you start to build those, those firmer foundations, then you, you can increasingly actively seek diversity. I think in particular, AI is going to demonstrate to us that diversity is a competitive advantage as increasingly the, the, the dull, dirty, dangerous, delicate, I've never heard the fourth D before, mm -hmm. activities start to be taken up by AI. 
then the diversity of thought, the diversity of background, the diversity of, of cultural concepts or frameworks is going to make the difference between whether or not you get something really out there in the market, which, which really speaks to people, or whether you produce another also ran. So, uh, so it's, it's definitely not a perfect answer, but having consistent rules of engagement to, to get those first steps completed and then opening up is, is about the best I can offer. Thank you very much.